Welcome to lecture 29 of anthropology. Today we're going to be examining the concept of technology, uh, the practical application of scientific knowledge to solve human problems. And um, we're going to actually walk through a specific example of technology in ancient Egypt and talk about how the Egyptians thought about improving and shaping their um, world through technology. Uh, the Greek word techne means craft. It's, it's something that you do by making. Um, uh, it refers to very practical sort of use of knowledge uh, to solve problems, problems that are important for humans to deal with. So it is really an application of science. It takes scientific knowledge and applies it to human affairs. The concern in this techne, this technology view of the world, is not with theoretical models. So there's not as much emphasis on can we develop a model of how natural phenomena work, but can we solve in real practical ways problems that we face? So to put it simply, it's the knowledge of how to, how to do things, how to get it done. One of the things that has been challenged over the last uh, 100 years is this idea that technology is progressive, that technology just gets better and better and better and better. We're kind of used to thinking of that way, partially because, you know, we have technology that gets better and better and better and better. Well, it kind of does. I mean, many aspects of technology in our lives uh, follow a pattern known as planned obsolescence. The idea that this piece of technology will deliberately be replaced with a newer version. And will that newer version necessarily be much, much better? Eh, not quite. Um, just because something is newer doesn't necessarily mean it's a progress over the past. And there are lots of ways to define progress. So keep in mind, technology doesn't necessarily automatically leap from better to better to best to best and keep on going 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 um and here's why problem solving very practical problem solving depends on what needs are understood and those needs are understood in a given moment a given context and in the next moment or context they might change so we have for right now a need for a coronavirus vaccine um, because of the nature of the pandemic that we're in. Right now, that is a very important need for us, but maybe in a few years, it won't be a need. The other thing to take a look at is that needs don't automatically translate into technology. Just because somebody needs something doesn't mean it is prioritized and valued. Um, needs in some groups of people can be easily ignored. Consider, for example, the AIDS epidemic of the early Reagan administration, when um, this mysterious illness um, was striking the San Francisco gay community, and it was very difficult to understand why, what was causing it. And the Reagan administration essentially turned a blind eye to it. They decided that as a value, it wasn't worth their time. These gay men dying didn't really matter to them, so who cares? So keep in mind that technology doesn't progress because our needs change over time, and plus that, we don't always value the needs the same way. In technology, the change that we experience can happen two ways. Sometimes we have a need and it generates uh, problem solving to give us technology. Somebody is trying to figure out the new and best way to solve a problem, build a better mousetrap, as the old story goes. And that need often drives people to experiment, to tinker, to innovate. But it's not always the case that needs drive change. In many cases, sometimes the change drives the need. 
and the introduction of a new technology changes people's needs and or wants. You know, before the invention of the smartphone, when everybody had flip phones, think about um, the, the need for information being primarily done through texting and phone calls. Many people didn't see the need for having uh, basically a handheld computer. But once the handheld computer came into existence, think about how that changed people's needs and or wants. And suddenly they couldn't live without the new technology. So keep in mind, technology sometimes is driven by our needs. Sometimes the technology happens and it changes what we need and or want. So what kind of technology did the Egyptians have? Well, they did all kinds of things. Um, I will point out that most of the technology of ancient Egypt is driven towards uh, two purposes. Either the state, this is for the king, this is what the king wants. We're gonna solve these problems for the Egyptian state or just for everyday life experiences, which sometimes also translates back into what does the king need and or want. Examples would be papyrus. How are we gonna keep track of the king's supplies and what's going on? Uh, well, the invention of a paper-like material made out of plants will help make that possible for everyday tracking of information. Ramps and levers to build giant monuments to honor the gods and the god who walks on earth as the king. Shipbuilding, so the Egyptians can sail all the way around the Mediterranean to get the wood and the other desired um, trade goods that they loved so much. Oh, excuse me, tribute that they loved so much. Mummification is an example of a technology. Learning how to process the body in order to preserve it after death. A means of transporting water uh, from one place to another, the Shaduf, um, really appears in the New Kingdom, and I'll show you a picture of one in just a moment, um, but this solves a practical need for everyday life of moving water to a new location for irrigation. Glass making, how can we make beautiful objects for our homes for the king? Metalworking, how can we make jewelry or spears? or any other implement for which metal would be the best material to use. And really great example of technology for the king, pyramid building, uh, which was innovated in Egypt. Um, you know, recall in the beginning, they built um, into the ground and probably put a sort of low mound over the top of it. Some papyrus, massive buildings, ships. The Shaduf, you can see um, here, the person has got um, a bucket which they will dip into the water. And this weight here will allow them to, um, they'll actively pull down against it. Good arm workout, right? Um, and then, of course, when they want to pull it up, the weight will pull back and pull the bucket up, and then they can pivot over and put the water in their fields. Some glassware, and finally some jewelry. Egyptologist John Ray has argued that, argued that the Egyptians are not so much innovators as they are perfectors. They're not tinkerers, um, sort of like the Henry Fords and the Thomas Edisons of America were tinkerers. Instead, he's, John Ray argues that the Egyptians adopt technology from other people and they just make it better. They improve it and make it work really well for them. And I'm gonna give you an example of this. So it's a rather long example that will illustrate some of the themes of this lecture. We're gonna talk about chariots and war. The Egyptians didn't have chariots um, in the beginning. 
And I mean, why would you want them? You have the Nile, you can sail up and down on that. Um, you can walk in Egypt. Um, who, who needs a chariot for traveling? You know, if you're wealthy, people can pick you up as you sit in your traveling little um, cart like uh, the queen mother Hetaferes did. But beginning around 1550 BCE, the Egyptians are going to turn to chariots um, to foster their imperialism. Um, and it's a unique kind of imperialism, so we'll talk about the dimensions of it. And the reason they're going to turn to chariots has to do with their own internal political dynamics. Because they're under the rule of a group of foreigners, um, the Hyksos or the Hekakasut, um, 1650 to 1535. These were Asiatic people, Amu, they were from um, the Near East. They settled in Egypt apparently very peacefully and blended into Egyptian communities in the Delta of the North. Um, but they aroused the jealousy of leaders down in Thebes um, in Upper Egypt. And the stories that the Egyptians tell about this are very nationalistic and very, yeah, Egypt, right? Kind of like America, but Egypt. And um, the, the famous sort of tipping off story has to do with the the king of the Hyksos um, ruling up in uh, the Delta sent a letter to the leader at Thebes, second Enre Tau, and said, I can hear the hippopotamuses down in Thebes bellowing at night and it's keeping me awake. You need to get rid of them. You need to silence them. And of course, second Enre Tau is uh, upset you know, just incredibly incensed and upset that how dare you, you know, talk about these um, hippopotami this way. So he launches a campaign to free Egypt. He dies horribly, but his son Amos will take over and lead the Egyptians to freedom and independence from these foreign rulers. Now, over the last 20 years, we've actually really discovered that the Hyksos are, yes, they're from Asia, but in fact, they came peacefully. There was no invasion of Egypt. Um, there's no, uh, no taking over of the Egyptians being put under the yoke. Um, in fact, the Hyksos had really good working relations with the Southern Egyptians. Um, the Hyksos adopted Egyptian culture and essentially practically were living like Egyptian people. Um, so this whole idea of this foreign invasion is not really true. Um, it's, it seems to be more or less a, a device to justify the leaders of Thebes trying to fight back um, and take over the country for themselves. The way that technology comes into this story is second Enre Tau's son, Kamos, um, apparently adopts the war chariot from the Hyksos, though there's debates about whether or not the Hyksos actually had the war chariot or borrowed it from somebody else too. Either way, the chariot comes into ancient Egypt. And it allows for people to ride very quickly in battle from a heightened position. You're standing up, um, you can maneuver around, um, and you can shoot arrows pretty effectively. A large supply of arrows can be kept in your chariot. So it's quite a, a useful war tool. Um, and in fact, um, Kamos uh, claims in his attack on the Hyksos that he's so swift and so devastating that it made the Hyksos women sterile. They just, their, their ovaries were just frightened into you know, non-existence. After the reconquest and reunification of, of Egypt, 
uh, to be four Egyptians. Go Egypt. The uh, Egyptian leadership of the New Kingdom relied on the chariot to conquer large por portions of the Near East. So the Egyptians campaigned um, actively and openly as an imperialistic power. So I could think, I could see room for saying that their treatment of their southern neighbor also smacked a little bit of imperialism. Um, scholars have pointed out that the Egyptian imperialism was not necessarily out of a sense of empire, of we need a giant, large, massive, large-scale empire to rule the world, that it may have been more for protecting Egypt's borders, keeping the possibility of um, dangerous and threatening people way out on the outskirts. And at the same time, the Egyptians could exact tribute. Um, they could exact um, gifts from these uh, conquered peoples uh, far away. Here we have some images of the Hyksos. Essentially, they adopt Egyptian culture, but they clearly don't look Egyptian. You can tell by their hair and their beards. Um, their names also indicate their non-Egyptian status. Um, the Hyksos ruled um, in Upper Egypt, Um, or I guess I should say Northern Egypt, not to use the, the term Egyptologists use. Um, so the Northern part around the Delta here is where the Hyksos have control. Down here in classically Upper Egypt is Thebes, where um, Second Enre, Tau, and Kamos, and Amos, and their whole family lead the campaign to free Egypt. This is um, Second Enray's mummy, which uh, scholars have shown recently, recently Kent Weeks and some other folks looked at this mummy and have suggested that he may have been executed by the Hyksos um, king. He has wounds um, on his face, which are quite um, strikingly um, awful wounds, battle ax wounds and stab wounds. Um, so we definitely uh, know that his his life came to a fairly brutal end, perhaps fighting the Hyksos and, and losing. So how did the Egyptians take these chariots and improve them? Because John Ray says they are um, perfectors. Well, the Egyptian chariot, where at becomes lighter, faster, more stable, and more maneuverable under Egyptian craftsmen. Made of wood that is bent, um, covered with usually leather. The bottoms of the chariot's floors here would be interlaced straps of leather. The wheels would be covered in leather. Usually the outside would be covered in leather as well. This chariot is from the tomb of Tutankhamun and therefore is much more fancy. This would not be for necessarily in battle. It's not quite as practical for that. The Egyptians um, take the wheels um, from a four spoke to a six spoke wheel, much stronger. They widen the chariot. You can see how wide this is. Um, so it's much more um, stable, doesn't tip as easily. Um, it's pretty maneuverable in turns. Um, it can hold two people. One person can hold the reins of the horses while the other person's actually shooting arrows. Um, and overall, it weighed probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 75 pounds or so. So it's pretty light, um, which means it's easier for horses to carry. And um, it itself is pretty maneuverable. Um, it's not a heavy sluggish thing.
So where does this all leave us in terms of technology? I want to bring it back to the idea of the ways in which technology influences our thinking, our needs, our wants, how our brains work. Um, and to point out that technology can change the way we think about the world. New technologies can change our understanding of ourselves, how we do work, how we, pro how we proceed and do business. I think a really great example of that is, of course, our transition in COVID to online learning. You've never seen so many teachers adopt new methods for teaching in an online environment. Zoom is now a verb. Um, I've got to Zoom later. Um, I'm all Zoomed out. Technology gives us new ways to address problems and then changes our thinking even about those problems. Um, it can even alter our values. I think a great example of this is the cotton gin, uh, which altered the ability of Southerners in the United States um, to process cotton and then changed their thinking about the future of slavery. Many people in the generation of early America figured that slavery would eventually die out in some way, it would not succeed, or in several generations it would just disappear. But cotton changes that, and it changes the way people think about the ownership of human beings. Um, instead of dying out, it actually massively expands. A great example of the way technology can you know, influence our thinking without sometimes even us thinking about it um, is a scholar, Edward Tuft, who wrote uh, a 28 page pamphlet, screed, I don't know what you would call it, not entirely scholarly, um, called The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint. And there are lots of criticisms of this piece but I think some of the criticisms um, could be taken you know, to heart, such as the way PowerPoint influences people to bullet point everything, to think in terms of bullets rather than like long connected sentences with full information. Um, he says that PowerPoint mutilates data beyond comprehension because the drive to make it fit on a screen reduces its complexity. So very complex, amazing quantities of data get simplified in PowerPoint because it's got to fit within the space that PowerPoint provides. And he says that it erases the connection between facts. The PowerPoint almost produces a fragmented view of knowledge and you lose in a PowerPoint setting everything that holds that knowledge together. So I don't know what you think about that, but I think it is a potent example of a ways in which a, a relatively useful technology that's ubiquitous in the United States may in fact change the way we think about presenting and sharing information. Well, that's been it for technology. I'll see you next time for Egyptian math.